hi, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Ariel Guerra Dames. I'm a second year uh, student of the machine learning and data mining master here at, uh, at the Jean Monnet University. Uh, the, as Professor Jacquinet just said, the objective of this presentation is mostly to give the introduction, the context to a problem that has been assigned to our cohort this year. Uh, we call it the MLDM project. It's been supervised by professors uh, Marcevin and uh, Rémi Monet of uh, Laboratoire d'Arcurien. And uh, uh, um, the, each of the three groups that are going to go after me are going to specify uh, a, a certain aspect of the project, right? Uh, so we hope you enjoy. And before beginning, I'd like to point out and remind, remind everyone, but especially our colleagues who are physicists, that we are computer scientists. So. Uh, bear with us in case we make any small mistakes in, the, uh, in a few assumptions that we might make during the project. So, uh, first, let's begin by using the keyboard because this is not working very well. Um, right? Oh, it works. Ah, it's still some. So, uh, first, let's position ourselves in the world of light matter interaction. Uh, one of the main challenges in this field is to uh, understand the dynamics, the space-time dynamics of ultra-fast laser beams. However, uh, unlike in other fields, uh, this is a bit difficult because present-day equipment is not fast enough because laser beams, light, light propagates too fast and uh, laser, beams are, laser pulses are very short. So, uh, some of you may also know that with, for the equipment that we do have to acquire some of these images, they are expensive. Uh, like scanning electron microscopy, which is one of the equipments that we have here in the laboratory. And also, while we do have some equations, we have observed that some uh, PDEs, like the swift oenberg equation, describe some of the dynamics that we can observe. Uh, they don't describe everything, and we, and we are not really sure about what's the interaction between laser parameters and uh, the data that we're observing. So the objective of this project is to use physics-informed machine learning to try to tackle these issues efficiently. So, as I said, the objective of this project is more or less to uncover the analytical expression of the partial differential equations, which can explain the self-organization of matter in a series of scanning electron microscopy images or observations. So for this, physicists here at the laboratory have given us a data set containing three trajectories, or three sequences of 50 images each, uh, and every trajectory has a set of laser parameters like fluence, the delay between two laser pulses and the number of double laser pulses. Now keep in mind that every one of these images in these sequences is just the result of an n number of pulses, double laser pulses, from 1 to 50, right? So we have our data. How do we learn these partial differential equations of the form ut plus a nonlinear uh, set of terms, which are parametrized by theta and um, by partial uh, derivatives in space and time? Well, our supervisors have suggested us to use sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics, or SINDI for short. Uh, it's an algorithm. It works with data, and it, uh, and it helps us to find the analytical expression of uh, the space, uh, sorry, the dynamics that we're observing in our data. So it begins by taking a sequence of uh, observations in time. In our case, it's images and their time derivatives. Then we build a library of nonlinear candidate uh, dev derivative terms, and we try to solve a sparsity promoting regression. Now, sparsity is key, as you can see by the zero norm here, because uh, we're all working on the assumption that good physical models, they have a few dominant terms, which actually influence the dynamics that we're observing. Um, so now we have our data, we have our algorithm. What are we missing? Uh, the truth is that by looking at the data, we will encounter a problem right away, and it's that the images are not registered. Now, what does that mean? As I said, in Cindy, we have a dictionary of derivative terms, which are parametrized by theta, which is going to be tuned according to this loss function. And here, we're going to run into a little problem, and it's that at some point, we're going to have to compare the pixels of one image, updated or multiplied by these terms, by the pixel, the same pixel in the same location in the next image. But how can we compare two consecutive pixels if they are not registered? Now, this is what we call the non-registration issue. Why that happens? It's at the moment of the acquisition of the images. Because of the scale that we're working in, it's very small, nanometric, um, 
at the moment of producing every impact, we have to take the substrate, the, the, the material out, we have to put it in the microscope, make an acquisition, put it back, make another number of impacts, and so on and so forth. And aligning these once they've been taken out is almost impossible. And this is why you'll see that the images, they look very similar, almost as if they could belong, almost as if they were a sequence, except that they're not really, we're not looking at the same atoms. So one possible way to solve this, for example, is optimal transport. Uh, and speaking of optimal transport, I don't know if any of you have ever asked yourself, what's the most efficient way to transform one distribution into another? Not me, but a uh, <laughs> French mathematician, Gaspard Monge, in, in 1781, he did in his, um, in his Mémoire sur la théorie des déblés et des ramblés. And uh, essentially what he asked is, what's the most efficient way to transport one pile of dirt and rubble to, from one location to another? where the total cost of transporting it using a shovel is uh, the sum of the individual shovel movements, right? We have a similar problem here, assuming that our images are discrete distributions. And uh, optimal transport then just guides us into the least costly method of moving distribution P, for example, which is our left distribution, into a distribution Q. Um, now, uh, solving an optimal transport problem gives us a really helpful insight, which is called the Wasserstein distance. The Wasserstein distance essentially measures the effort that is required to transport some set distribution from P to Q. Uh, and it's defined, as you can see here, just by the cost, the sum of the costs uh, between one location and the other, and as a transport plan gamma, which is really how much mass we're going to be transporting from one place to the next one. So now I'd like to hand it over to my colleagues of all three teams. Uh, each team, as I said, is going to focus on a specific aspect. Uh, team one, my team, is going to focus on the non-registration issue. Team two, from what I last I understood, they're going to focus mostly on the impact of free processing. And team three, I think they did something like a genetic algorithm. We'll, we'll see uh, effectively if that's the case. Uh, but yeah, that's about it for the introduction. If anyone has any questions, now is the time, because that way you can understand the following presentations. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, good morning. My name is Felipe and Chris Bastian. I'm with members, we're students from the NLDM Master Program. And we're members of the team number one, aimed to, as my colleague said, to, we are aimed to solve the non-registration issue as our, our one of the important features in our, in our solution. So now, we saw that the problem that the college introduced previously can be, boil, it boils down in two main sub-problems. We have first, the registration of the images, and also we need to take the images that we registered in Apply Cindy to identify the underlying PDEs in the data. Now, we as a team, we took the decision to really focus on the registration of the images. For this reason, we proposed three different methods. We're going to go really briefly in the theory of the three of them. So first one, we have the change map registration approach, inspired by remote sensing techniques. We extract the time, uh, time variant line features, as you can see in the image. And we extract the features, then doing a difference between these features in a sequence of images, we're able to map the changes. These changes are really important because in a sequence of images, we're going to see the difference of these features across a sequence, which is going to be really useful in the problem that we have in hand. Now, next, we have the deformation field registration approach. This, this registration approach inspired by medical image uh, analysis. We have uh, the structure that you can see in the slide. We have two images from a sequence. We're going to feed the two of them in a fully convolutional neural network in order to learn a deformation field. As you can see, for example, in the second image on the right uh, with the letter C, we're going to take this deformation field and we're going to interpolate the, it with the second uh, image of the sequence then we're going to create a new artificial one that's going to be called the warped image. We want this last image to be as close as possible as the fixed one in order to first have at the end of this model a sequence of images created artificially that are going to be registered. Finally, but not least, taking the theory explained of the optimal transport and also phase correlation, we have the last process. This process consists mainly in two steps. First, we're going to find, find the best matching pairs of patches using phase correlation. When he, we have the best matching pairs of patches in the sequence of the images, we're going to apply the Debye's synchron convolution by centers. In other words, we're going to add intermediate representations of the, of the patches, as you can see, for example, in the image. 
then it's not going to result only in a good registration of the sequence of the images, but also is going to work as a data augmentation technique because we're going to duplicate the amount of images that we have, which is really useful in machine learning sometimes. Now um, that we heard a lot about the registration methods, let's uh, take a look at the results. Um, we want to align those uh, two images. We consider this to be the first image in the trajectory and this to be the second image. And um, if we apply the change map procedure, which uh, Philippe presented, we observe uh, this kind of images. And it's really interesting because we have here the, the white uh, points, which are the areas which uh, changed, and the black points, which are the areas which uh, didn't change. For the, for the deformations, um, we obtain something else. We obtain the, um, yeah, the, the deformation uh, fields. And uh, for the uh, optimal transport, we obtain the optimal transport plan, which we uh, calculate by using Barry centers. And uh, what is really interesting about it is uh, that we are obtaining similar patterns here. We always uh, see the dots we uh, also have in the original images. Um, yeah. Let's um, take a step uh, further. We have the registered images now, and we want to derive PDEs from it. So we are using Cindy, and uh, in this case, we use the Python the impl implementation of uh, the Silver from uh, 2020. And uh, basically, we had to do three things. We had to choose a candidate function library, which means we had to choose what uh, components uh, we want to have in the equations we derive. Um, we chose to have polynomials up to degree three and uh, derivatives up to the fourth degree. Then we had to think about a uh, differentiation method. Uh, and in this case, we used the uh, 2D spectral uh, derivatives and we had to choose an optimizer and uh, we were using SDLSQ. <clears throat> Let's uh, take a look at uh, the results we obtained. And um, what, what we see, it's quite amazing. Like, um, you, you can imagine, we have the original trajectory. We registered it, we derived um, uh, equations from it, and now we plotted it. And what we are seeing here is that we are obtaining um, the same patterns as before. Um, before we had uh, the points, if you recall, in the original images, and we um, we are obtaining, um, like by time it's getting more stable and uh, more clear, but we are obtaining the same the same patterns, which is like a visual clue that our methods are are working. Um, we also uh, checked uh, some other matrices to uh, see if our um, if our solution is uh, is is good. And uh, one one thing we were doing is uh, looking at the pixel normalized error. Um, and we see, for example, for the optimal transport, which is the um, which is the one here, um, we see that the error is quite uh, low. For the other methods, it's uh, rather stable. Um, we always uh, we also did a spectral analysis of our uh, solution, which uh, means like an radially averaged uh, frequency response. Um, in this case, of a raw image, and uh, we also did a spectral analysis um, of um, yeah of of the uh, and, the, and the raster split of uh, power um, spectrums for all frames, which uh, you can see uh, which you can see here. One other thing uh, we looked at are correlations. Um, in the paper of Brondau, Ariel uh, mentioned uh, in the beginning, we can see that there are some uh, correlations between the coefficients. And um, we wanted to see if we can find something similar in the uh, equations we derived. And it's quite nice because we see, for example, between u and u squared, a high negative correlation. And uh, it's also something indicating that our solution is, is good. Um, that was our presentation. Thank you a lot for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, especially for the matrices, we uh, have some extra slides if you're interested. Thank you.